How do you feel about sweatshops? There are a lot of young Americans who want to rid the world of them. They're demanding that rules be passed. A contractor making clothes for sportswear giant Nike has been caught using forced labor in Malaysia. Undercover investigation by the Senate last month. There were shakes in the districts because it's thousands of miles away why on earth is that acceptable so most of what we understand in terms of the rise and the return of the sweatshop in its global form because of course there were sweatshops in the 19th century and early 20th century in the global north the return of the sweatshop in some sense is a, is a product of uh, corporate lobbying to loosen trade rules to make it easier to move uh, manufacturing operations out of the global north, for instance, in the apparel sector, um, where most clothes in, bought and consumed in the United States in 1980 were made in the United States. It's almost impossible to find clothing made in the United States anymore. So those were trade rules that were loosened and made lax so that investments could move overseas. This happened beginning in the, in the 80s. Um, those coupled with the growth of large retail outlets that kind of um, promise consumers a low-cost alternative. So they uh, also buy up bulk from the apparel manufacturers or electronic manufacturers, and they are, have the power, because they have such market power, to bid down costs. The corporations, for example, uh, in the U.S. or any other you know, country, are not genuinely committed to fair labor practices, then these companies, uh, these countries then are uh, perpetuating uh, what is known as colonialization. We, we are still going to these places overseas and uh, taking resources uh, from those people and, and uh, exploiting them. <laughs> China. I love my friends. Tibet. Oh no. Bali. Cambodia. China. Macau. Honduras. So much variety. China. Paraguay. And last but not least, China again. We, we expect our stuff to come cheaply. We, we, we expect to be able to, you know, pick up a t-shirt at the Gap and not have it cost much um, until, we, until we do away with the idea that, you know, our stuff is disposable. You know, whether it's our clothing or the way our food is packaged, whatever. No, I don't think we're going to solve that problem. This isn't the kind of problem that can be solved by a company coming up with a CSR policy and trying to impose it on a factory somewhere. For Americans, one of the things we need, you know, that can happen is we need to have a re, you know, return to stricter labor standards and enforcement standards in our trade policy. So that what we're uh, insisting on as people is using our democracy to insist that corporations can't just move overseas to take advantage of cheaper labor. Another big thing, of course, is really look at what we're buying, really, really looking at the, the, the moral, doing a moral test on it. How was this made? Why was this made? who made it and under what conditions did they make it and what are the consequences of them being employed, employed under those conditions. There's a nonprofit in England that went into the factories and asked the women, if you were to come up with the policy, what would it look like? And it was very different. And I would love to see more of that type of work, much more ground up driven from the people affected and actually working at that interface to 
make their lives better. They said it, to them it's not about the number of hours per week as much, et cetera, as it is about not being sexually harassed, not having to uh, stand on their feet when they're pregnant. Um, you know, a lot of the things that never come into company consciousness here when they're trying to come up with a policy that they think American consumers will like. So maybe that's where we need better awareness. We need to, we need to be talking to the people on the ground, not trying to impose from on top. Well, it's interesting because in uh, 1999, the United States and Cambodia entered into a trade agreement that um, is called the UCTA. And in this agreement, the key stakeholders included um, labor, as well as the local and uh, international business interests, um, the uh, non-governmental um, organizations, NGOs, as well as national and international um, government agencies. So the agreement was really aimed at addressing these issues that uh, would protect the rights of the workers and engage business interest in acknowledging that there were issues that needed to be addressed here. And I think that that's the kind of endeavor that can start this process, but it doesn't guarantee that the um, situation will be perfect and that um, the, the sweatshops won't still exist. Nicholas Kristof wrote that column a few years ago where he said the world needs more garment factories, not fewer. And it was very controversial at the time, remains controversial, but there's a point there. Um, if there isn't the job in the garment factory, then where's the income? And what are you doing? And, you know, I look at places like Ikea, who has refused to ever sign on to the Rugmark label, which says new child labor used because when they were originally accused of child labor being used in their rugs, they immediately investigated. They found out that indeed there was, but then they spent a year working with UNICEF and Save the Children to find out why were these kids working. Found out that the kids had to in some cases in order to eat, and that education and lack of education was a real issue. So now in their factories, they will employ kids of a certain age provided they also go to the IKEA provided school for so many hours a day. You know, that to me is the type, those are the type of solutions we need to be looking for. It's not an either or. And again, it goes back to that, we need to be talking to the people involved. Now, again, you're getting at, you know, much larger structural issues. You look at Cambodia, this wouldn't have been as much of an issue if it hadn't been for the Vietnam War, if it hadn't been for Pol Pot and the genocide there. So, you know, you start pulling on the thread and you unravel a very big piece. And can, can journalism help? I like to think so. I like to think public relations can help. Uh, I like to think of if enough of us keep saying this, that it gets out there. Where did you get those shoes? Those shoes must be something special, man, because I heard in Thailand they've got nine-year-olds that will sit, sweat, and sew, and go and go and go and go and go to that machine, don't sew no more. I hope you know, man, those shoes are something special.